Hadouken! Okay, so tonight's um, webinar is about um, is about animating non-humans, and this is based on a webinar or this is based on a panel discussion that I was on at Annecy this year, where we were talking about animating non-human characters, and it was a really really interesting panel with a lot of uh, really talented people on it. And so I wanted to develop it a little bit further and talk about some of the projects that I've worked on over the year, in particular, uh, The Lion King, uh, animating cats, uh, Harry Potter, where we animated some birds, magical birds, open season, where I had to animate a bear and a deer, uh, robots, which was robots, and the Chronicles of Narnia, a giant sea serpent. And I wanted to talk about Alan in, in brief. This is not a tutorial. This is, this is a webinar discussing the challenges involved in animating these different these different creatures, because you, you know when you're working in an animation studio, you're going to get handed a brief on Monday morning, and you don't necessarily know how you're going to get that shot approved by Friday afternoon. So what you need is techniques that help you get through the work. So I'm going to talk in brief about each one of these things, and I would really like to have questions as I go along because it will make this much more interactive. If you guys ask me questions. Um, and, and, and stop me and say, well, how did you do that? Or how did this work as we go? And then that'll make it much more interactive and fun. So first of all, uh, and I'll talk for about 40 minutes and then take questions afterwards. So the, the whole thing will run about an hour, but hopefully at the end of it, you'll get an idea of how you approach the challenge of animating different kinds of creatures on different kinds of shows. So first of all, I'm gonna show you uh, some video. So let's go ahead and play some video of a few of the films we're gonna talk about here. So that was the death of the sea serpent from uh, Voyage of the Dawn Treader. Uh, this video here has no audio. It's just the um, uh, magical birds that we're interested in, uh, which I animated, although I didn't do the little explosions um, at the end here. And this is from uh, Robots back in uh, 2003. Some slight sync problems there at the end. So um, let's start by talking about Lion King, which I haven't showed you uh, a clip of yet. But this um, was a movie that I worked on back in uh, some time ago now, back in 1993. Uh, and it was a really lucky break for me to work on that movie. Uh, and I got a really fantastic shot. I got a real hero shot. So they gave me to animate the um, the shots, uh, the the shot at the start and the end of um, Scar's song. So I'm just going to take the mute the volume down there. So this is the one we're interested in, and this shot is really about cat locomotion, right? In order to pull off something like this, you've got to have a pretty good idea of how animals move, uh, and it's a real challenge to get this stuff right. It's difficult. Um, and the animators who are currently remaking Lion King at Framestore in London will be going through all of the same problems, all of the same challenges, only this time with digital tools. But the basic challenges remain the same, whether you're drawing it or working uh, in, in, in 3D. Um, so let me just show you a few slides to show that the, the approach that we took. Um, so, Cats in Motion, which is basically what this is about. Um, the challenge with quadrupeds is you can't really film yourself doing it, right? You, you're, you're reliant on 
live action reference, you're reliant on, on being able to film cats in motion. Uh, you're reliant on finding information about the mechanics of what you're doing. Now, this slide here is taken from the Animal Survivals Kit, um, which is the book that all animators should own. It's the one we recommend most strongly here at Escape Studios. And you'll see that um, this slide suggests that all animals walk alike. And it is true, quadrupeds basically walk in the same way. So once you can learn to animate one quadruped, you can learn to animate the others. There are some differences in anatomy. Cows, for example, have a very, very inflexible inflex spine, um, uh, whereas cats uh, are much, much more flexible. You get this nice um, kind of uh, kink here in the, in, in the back when they're, when they're sitting. And uh, this obviously informs the animation. And the, the science behind it is quite technical. It's to do with the size of their stomachs um, uh, and therefore the enormous uh, backbone that, that ruminants like cows need in order to carry this uh, giant stomach that they have. Now, you would be tempted when you're animating this kind of thing to go back to other animators' work, like, for example, the work of, of the great Disney animator Milk Carl. Uh, who did this, this walk cycle from um, uh, the Jungle Book. But it's always a little bit dangerous to look at other animators' work. And you're better off in general going back to the real source material. Um, Edward Mybridge is a great uh, resource for figuring out animal and, uh, and, and also human locomotion. It's, it's very, very old. This stuff goes back to the late 19th century, but it's still an incredibly useful source of re reference. And you always want to be going back to the real thing. You're always looking for the real source material. Now, in the case of Lion King, we had uh, some great reference that had been put together by some of the lead animators. This is by Ruben Aquino, who's a really brilliant um, animator uh, from the Philippines, who did these uh, walk cycles um, for us so that, so that junior animators like me would have something to work from. And I cleaned these up a little bit. This is the one I actually use for the classroom. Uh, it's a simplification of, of Ruben's walk. And I always like to start with the front right foot contact. And I do like to uh, uh, annotate my drawing so that I really, really know uh, exactly where everything is happening. Front left foot contact, uh, front right foot contact, front left foot contact, so that, uh, actually that should say, that's a typo, sorry. That should say rear left foot contact. It's a mistake there. Um, but uh, being able to break these things down so that you really understand the locomotion is really, really vital to doing this kind of thing. And you also need to be able to follow uh, under the supervision of a lead animator. In this case, it was Andrea Stasia who, who, who really set the tone for this character and really created this character and, and, and made it his own. And, and I followed very closely under his supervision. And, and he would actually go over my drawings uh, and make sure that I was on model and I was doing it all um, correctly. So that's a little taster of, of Lion King. That was one particular challenge, uh, doing realistic uh, cat locomotion. And what you would find, what the, the big difference between this uh, production and the current Lion King is that the, the work of animators on, on Lion King today at places like at, at, at Framestore would be much more library based. So if you're an animator on, on the new Lion King, what you'll be doing is walk cycles and run cycles, just like Ruben Aquino did for everyone. But those walk and run cycles will actually go into a library so that when you get a shot, you can extract that material. You can actually import those walk cycles into your shot and use that as the basis for the animation that you're doing. And that's the really key difference is that, is that you don't really get the ownership of the shot in, in the same way anymore that you're used to in the old days, because now it's much more of a library based approach. But in a way, it's just as fun because you can go in at the beginning of a show and you can start working on these things um, and you can have your own, uh, you know, you can contribute to that library yourself uh, and, and create those, um, those walk cycles and run cycles yourself. So, Let's talk about um, Harry Potter. Uh, here's, a, here's the, um, I'll just show you that uh, clip again. Here's the, the Harry Potter clip. This was another really fun show to work on. And it's just always fun working on Harry Potter because you, you never have to go through that thing of going to a party and people say, oh, you work in animation. What have you done that I've seen? Uh, as if you have mind reading capabilities. Everybody asks the question. And if you've worked on Harry Potter, then you know that they'll have seen it. So we had to do these, um, these birds. And again, it's very much about 
in this case, it was a library based approach. We did flap cycles. I was working with another animator um, and we did flap cycles, uh, fast flap cycles, slow flap cycles of birds in motion. And then these were then attached to a motion path, uh, which, which, which um, uh, then informed the mode. So you, so you create the motion path and then attach the birds to the motion path. And then they're all flapping away. And then uh, I think this was done on a motion path as well. And then they're flying towards Ron. Of course, it's all motion blurred. You can barely see them, uh, but they were very detailed models. And then we did not do, uh, the, the, the uh, explosion at the end was done by the um, technical animator, Holger Voss, who, who figured out that part of it. Um, but it's very much, we actually teach a, a tutorial at Escape Studios, which is almost exactly the same and is essentially based on this shot that I animated, uh, which is how to animate a bird in flight. And if you actually go to the Escape Studios website, uh, we have a webinar, uh, we have a, an online tutorial, um, which takes you through this uh, and shows you how to do it step by step. But it's again, it's very much about going back to reference, you know, how are you going to make a bird flap in a way that's convincing. And you've got to go back to MyBridge, you've got to go back to the real thing, you're going to have to study birds in motion very, very carefully. Um, there's a, a question here from uh, Mandeep uh, Purawal. Uh, do, do I feel like the animation library approach takes the joy out of animation because of the lack of pure ownership? Um, actually, that's, a, that's actually a really good question. So why don't we, let's, let's tackle that right here and now. I would say no, because I think that what happens is that if you're, is that you get to contribute to the library. So your work will be, if you do a great walk cycle on an animal, you know, that walk cycle will get rolled out on other um, people's work. We actually, we actually had this problem at Escape Studios on, on a student project that, that I was overseeing. Some of the second year animators did a, um, uh, a short film involving dragons and I recommended the library approach to them and they weren't very keen on it precisely for that reason because they wanted ownership of each shot. Uh, and I kind of wish and with hindsight that I'd been tougher on them because what actually ended up happening was that all the, the, the dragons looked different in every shot and there was no continuity of animation across the piece. And it would have been a much stronger piece if they had followed the library approach because they would have had a more consistent uh, um, work, a, a more consistent outcome, and it would have been better. So I think the library approach actually takes out a lot of the problems with animation because of course in the old days, one of the big differences, difficulties was that everybody would draw the characters slightly differently. So you had to spend a lot of effort just making sure that the, the drawing and the animation was consistent. Whereas if you have a library, you don't need to worry about that nearly so much. So birds obviously flap, they propel themselves through the air um, and you're gonna have to do a cycle, which is what we did on the Harry Potter shot. Now, uh, the thing about birds is that they don't flap in exactly the way you think they're going to. Uh, you'll notice here with this, this, I think this isn't, I'm not sure what kind of bird this is, but its wings are actually coming down and forwards. You'd think that the wings would be kind of going backwards, but they don't. They actually go forwards. Uh, and this is the kind of counterintuitive thing that you only get if you actually look very carefully at the live action reference. Um, here's a, um, a basic cycle taken from um, uh, timing for animation, uh, but by an, this is an old fashioned book. And there's also a really, really good uh, tutorial, which I won't go into in detail now by Brendan Body, who's a brilliant UK based animation um, uh, animator. If you Google Brendan Body flight, you'll find lots of really, really useful information on, uh, on bird uh, flaps or on birds in flight. Um, so you're going to need to find a row, the one, uh, a crow, uh, a rig, the one we use in, in uh, Escape is, is taken from Turbo Squid, although this is actually no longer uh, available. But you're going to need to use Google reference, you're going to need to go to uh, YouTube, uh, and you might even end up filming your own reference of crows, because sometimes the best reference is what you go out and film. And, and when we, we have Framestore come in to, to oversee some of our classes, um, uh, we, we had them overseeing some of the second year animation projects and uh, Oz Ghani, was who was one of the lead animators over there, was talking about the fact that an animator might spend 50% of their time on a shot just finding the right reference for that shot. 50% of their time. And that's an extraordinary amount. And that shows you how useful and how important reference is these days in terms of getting a great result. 
Um, now, Biswadeep Das has just asked me, what would be the reference library for some unknown creatures? Do we have to imagine? Yeah, I mean, that's a really good question. And actually, the last clip I'm going to show you here is, is well, I'll come back to that sea serpent at the end from Voyage of the Dawn Treading, because that's really, that's really tricky. And like, if you think about what they had to do on how to train your dragon at DreamWorks, um, that was a real challenge because you're, you're animating creatures that don't exist and you can't get reference so you've got to combine you you've got to combine reference you you might need some reference of a lizard scuttling or you know uh, a bird in flight uh, and that can make it really tough so so yeah that that becomes much 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 harder because you're having to combine the anatomy of different creatures but you're basically making a for the flap cycle it's essentially a mechanical process you've got to make the the cycle work uh, anyone who's been to one of our taster days will be familiar with this because we, we do this on the animation taster day. Um, and then once you've got your, uh, your cycle working, you can turn on infinity curves to offset curves, make things flexible, give it overlapping action. Uh, and then you might, uh, on the taster day, we have students import a, a little chapel and then have it fly around the steeple, which is a really fun little exercise. But you need to create a motion path, which is kind of like a roller coaster track. Um, and then you're attaching the motion cycle to the roller coaster track, and you can move the track around to get a really quick and accurate uh, result. And there's a question here from Gautam Shenoy. How would you approach while animating a character who can run on all fours, but can, who can fight while on two legs wielding a weapon of some sort? <laughs> That's a great question. But I think I'm going to pass on that one for now because <laughs> I've got absolutely no idea. The transition between four-legged and two-legged, that's a really tricky one. Um, I, guess, I guess probably you're going to have to film reference of yourself doing that. Um, so you're probably going to have to try and film yourself running on all fours and then transitioning to um, two-legged. So but we'll come on to the use of live action reference in, 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 a, in a little bit. Um, so then you're going to have to adjust the motion path uh, and deform it um, and create a whole, you can duplicate the paths, you can duplicate the crows and you can create a whole, a whole kind of flock of them, uh, which is what we did on, on the Potter movie. So it's very much a reference-based approach. Um, and uh, uh, you can get really, really nice results because you've basically got one cycle. Uh, these are all these birds are basically identical. And then obviously at the end, we had to, to manually um, create this, this sort of ease in and then ease out here. But then they come in and they, they smash into Ron. Um, and uh, it was all about getting the pattern right. So it's the sort of swooshing to feel satisfying and, and, and attractive. Okay, so let me talk about um, some stuff from uh, Open Season, which is a film I worked on at Open, Sony Imageworks a while back. Uh, and here's a, um, here's a shot of Boog the Bear. So those were two shots that I animated on, on open season. And the one I want to talk about is the first one. And that's the reason I want to talk about this first one is because this is the one that I actually have the uh, thumbnails draw, thumbnail drawings from. So when I say the first one, I mean the first sort of hero shot here. Now this is a bear talking to a deer, right? But basically, actually, this one is kind of a cheat because I'm, anima I'm talking about animating non-human characters in this webinar, but this one really was just like animating a human character because really Boog is a person in a bear suit, right? He's not really a bear, he's just a guy. And so this was very much, the approach to this was very much like you would take if you were animating human characters. And it's important to remember that sometimes, you know, the characters we animate, the, you might say it's a bear, but <laughs> it isn't really. Uh, and there what you're doing is essentially filming live action reference uh, and creating thumbnail sketches and approaching it in much the same way that you would a normal piece of, of um, animation. Um, so, 
So here's a few slides just to show how I approach this. Because I do, I actually have thrown away most of the thumbnails, thrown away or lost most of the thumbnail sketches that I've put together over the years. But in this case, I do actually have them. So the line of dialogue was, was Boog, um, and the actor says, uh, uh, when I'm a bearskin rug, they can walk all over me. But until that happens, I ain't going out without a fight. So it was a pretty juicy line. It was, it was, um, uh, it was delivered in a really nice way. So I had a really great starting point there to animate the line. Oh, and I'm just going to pop in and see a question here. Uh, from Biswadeep Das, he says, how to make a creature's expressions more readable, appealing? I mean, what are the key factors we should consider more important? Okay, so on the subject of expressions, actually that ties in nicely to what I'm doing because you can see if you look at my thumbnails here, I'm really doing my best. What I'm really looking for in the thumbnails is how do I get the expressions going? And I'm looking for, I guess in this case, it's a combination. If you had to describe Boog's expression here, in, in this line, it's a combination of anger and defiance. When I'm a bearskin rug, they can walk all over me. But until that happens, I ain't going out without a fight. And the story point here is that the hunters are gonna come in and kill all the animals. And, and now Boog is kind of gathering everyone together and they're gonna turn the tables on the hunters and they're gonna, um, they're gonna make sure that the hunters get, gets what, get what's coming to them. So the crucial thing here is the kind of the dominant expression, which is anger and, uh, and a kind of blend of anger and probably, and I'd say determination or defiance. Now, when you get something like this, uh, you, the first thing you wanna do is break down the line of dialogue into chunks. So here it broke down naturally. When I'm a bearskin rug, they can walk all over me. But until that happens, I ain't going out without a fight. So I basically know that I need roughly four or five poses for this shot. Uh, and that's exactly how it worked out with the thumbnails. When I'm a bearskin rug, so I've got, I've got Boog kind of looking at Elliot. When I'm a bearskin rug, and I've got a little sort of B panel there for the word rug. They can walk all over me, and he's kind of leaning in towards Boog. They can walk all over me, and he's got, and I'm, I went for a kind of almost cliched thing. They can walk all over me, where he just puts his hands on his chest. But that, that seemed like the natural acting gesture. But until that happens, and he kind of wob does, goes back and does a kind of head wobble, puts his hands on his, his, um, his hips, I ain't going out, and he kind of kind of lifts up his arm there in a sort of um, anticipation without a fight, and then he does this kind of thing with his fist uh, and then moves out. Um, and I think if we go back to the video, I can show you, it came out almost exactly the same way I planned it, but not quite, I'll show you where it's different. And so the, the big difference is there is in the thumbnails, I had him going the other way with his fist. You can see I've got the fist going there and he kind of does an exit stage right thing, but that actually didn't really work out because it was much more important that Boog maintained his eye contact with Elliot all the way through, which is one of the most important things with anim when you're animating two characters is make sure they look at each other. So, and then went to the next one. And actually, there's a, there's a question here from Nehru Prakash, who asks, IK or FK, which is the best way to animate? Uh, that's a good question. That's quite a technical one. Um, generally speaking, uh, it sort of depends on the shot, really. I assume you're talking about the hands, because with, with feet, you're almost always using IK, because you want the feet to stick to the ground. Um, but with the arms, uh, it kind of depends. If you're animating a sword fight, you'd probably want to go IK. If you're doing a walk cycle, it would probably be FK. So it's very, very shot dependent. Uh, I honestly don't remember wh which, which I chose with this shot because this was a while ago now. This is going back more than, more than 10 years. But I think the key takeaway here is that when you're animating characters like this, it's really people. And, and you're going to use the same workflow that you would use for humans in a, in a you know, if you, if you were animating human beings, you're going you're gonna to use, you're going to film yourself acting the shot out so you get some nice acting. You're going you're gonna to make thumbnail sketches based on the key poses, uh, and then you're going to transpose that into your animation. So it's very much a, 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 an acting-based approach where you're filming yourself or somebody else acting it out, and then using that as reference for your shot. And then uh, Bhavya uh, Sanjeev asks, how does size play into animating a creature's movements and using references? For example, if you had a Godzilla-sized mouse, 
how do you apply the reference for a material of a small mouse? Well, the answer to that is, is size is important. And you really couldn't because, because big animals walk or animate in a different way to little ones. And actually, I highly recommend you check out some of the work by Stuart Sumida. Stuart Sumida is a brilliant uh, paleontologist who, who, who actually works uh, as a consultant on many of the movies that get made in Hollywood. And he, he was a consultant, in fact, on Lion King and also on uh, Spirit, Stallion and Cimarron, which is a movie I worked on. And Stuart is very impressive on, on animal anatomy and how it relates to animation. Uh, for example, uh, animating elephants. Uh, you cannot do a run cycle with an elephant. Why? Because elephants cannot run. And the reason elephants cannot run is they are simply too big. So if you're animating elephants what, running, what you actually end up doing is a speed walk. So you would not be able to use reference material for, say, a mouse running for an elephant running because the physics simply don't work. If an elephant were to run, it would actually kill itself uh, because of the, the, the weight and the damage it would do to its own limbs. So they don't run. You'll, you won't see footage at YouTube of elephants running. Now, if you watch George of the Jungle, the movie, you will see elephants running. But that's because it's a gag and it's kind of cartoony and they sort of got away with it. But if you want to be accurate, they speed walk. Okay, so that's a little bit of open season. Uh, let me go back to, um, let's go back. Yeah, let me show you some of the stuff from robots. Because again, one of the nice things about robots is that I do actually have some of my thumbnails from, from that movie. Um, and again, robots is kind of a cheat because I'm doing this webinar on animating non-humans, but really the animation on, on robots was about animating humans. They're basically humans in robot suits. And this, this was the first movie I worked on where I had to learn CG. So this is an interesting shot here. This, this one here with um, uh, Cappy uh, in, in, I don't have the thumbnails for this one, but the reason I wanna talk about it is because it, it, it feeds into um, something that's very important for animators which is learning how to take notes. And Cappy says, um, where the line of dialogue is, so she says this, this oil splat, she says this oil splattered all over the page. Now I can remember when I, when I first showed my first blocking of this shot in animation dailies to Chris Wedge, <coughs> one of the other animators um, uh, pitched in in animation dailies and she said, because my animation was quite different to this, she said, you know, if I was animating this shot, I would have had Cappy uh, touch the oil uh, and kind of look at it and, and kind of run it through her fingers. Uh, and that would be the right acting gesture for me. That's what she said in dailies. And I was kind of annoyed when she said that because I can remember thinking, well, who's biz? None of your business. <laughs> you know, you're not animating this shot. I'm animating this shot. And, um, uh, you know, and Chris Wedge is the guy. He's the director. He's the one giving me notes. And actually, after I'd got over my kind of egotistical, I mean, I didn't say any of this, of course, uh, in dailies. But when I went back to my desk and actually, uh, actually, uh, tried out her suggestion, I realized that it was actually much better than the acting choice that I had made. And when I put that into action, it actually ended up being how the shot got approved. So the, the kind of takeaway from that is never be afraid to listen to the ideas of the other people in the room, regardless of whether they're directing or, or not directing. If somebody has an intelligent idea, you want to incorporate that into your work, because that can be a really great way of getting a really nice result with your work because it was the right acting choice. And just the fact that I hadn't thought of it didn't mean that it wasn't the correct acting choice. Uh, Pedro uh, Antonio Dondi Chudian asks, who does the camera framing? Now that's a good question, but actually on a movie, uh, you will find that the, the 3D layout department will do the camera framing. So in all of these shots that I'm showing you here, somebody else, 3D layout did the camera work um, and I animated within that. Now that doesn't mean that you cannot change the camera framing on a shot, but you must never change it without telling anyone. So what you do, if you want to change the way that the camera is framed, you create your own camera, an animation camera, and then you make a play blast of that, or you do a, a, a basic render of that, 
and then you show that as an alternate in dailies. So in animation dailies, you send the version with the, uh, with the approved, because remember that it's a director approved thing that's come to you. You send it with the director approved camera, and then you send your own camera, not approved, but your animation camera, and you say, I think this works better, but see what you think, and if you prefer the old one, we'll go back to it. So again, you, you, you kind of have to park your ego at the door, make the suggestion, but understand that there may be a reason why the camera framing was chosen by the 3D layout department and approved by the director. Now, the, shot, the other shot I want to show you here is this little one here at the end, where Fender says to Rodney, you're about to get very popular. There we go. And it's just a little shot. And it's essentially a three pose shot. Um, and I do unusually, I kept the thumbnails from that one. Uh, I wish I'd kept more of my thumbnails over the years, but they are really super helpful. And I personally find that if I don't thumbnail stuff, it doesn't really come out that well. So these are my thumbnails from, from this shot. As you can see, I've written down the line of dialogue, brace yourself, you're about to get very popular. So again, essentially, this is a kind of three pose shot. It's gonna have a beginning, a middle, and an end. Uh, the beginning is Fender and Rodney standing there, then Fender kind of leans in to Rodney uh, and, then, and then looks away again. So I, I always write down the line of dialogue, try and figure out where the main accents are, brace yourself, you're about to get very popular. Uh, and then and then thumbnail those out. So and I always do it like this, like a little cartoon strip, you know, with the character talking and just a little rough sketch. And I always do a little frame there so that I can get a feeling for the framing of it uh, and, and kind of uh, navigate my way through. So there you go. So it goes, brace yourself. You're about to get very popular. And that's it. It's a three pose shot. But once you nail those poses and the thumbnail sketches and make sure that the expressions are right, because here's, Rodney's, there's a com combination of kind of fear uh, and surprise there because Rodney's starting to get worried here because everybody's about to come to him for spare parts. Um, and anxiety also on Fender's faces. So that's Fender's face. That's one of the key things you're, you're doing in thumbnails is trying to establish the dominant expression. What is the character thinking and feeling? Uh, what are the audience going to get from this? Because if you, if you don't show that, if you don't show what the character is thinking and feeling, then, then the shot will be flat. Um, I won't have any kind of emotional um, connection. Okay, so before I run out of time, I just want to show you uh, this uh, sea serpent shot that I did uh, on the Chronicles of Narnia. Actually, I think we've got a little bit, of, little bit more time because we did start late. Um, and this was a, um, a really, really difficult shot, probably one of the hardest shots I've ever had to do uh, on a movie. And I got to do a bunch of these. I, I got to animate the, the, the sea serpent dying, but those were much, much easier. Uh, the one that was really tough was this first one here. And you, you can't see a lot of this because a lot of this is covered up by the water effects. But what's actually happening here is the dragon, who's called um, Eustace, because he's a little boy who's been transformed into a dragon, um, is, being, is being grabbed by this giant sea serpent who, who who emerges from under the water and throws Eustace up in the air, <laughs> catches him in his jaws, uh, shakes him, and then throws him at the rock. And the only bit you can actually see is the sea serpent kind of throwing Eustace at the rock and, um, uh, and then kind of reacting. But I still had to animate all of this stuff really, really carefully because of course, uh, you know, and I, I did actually say this in animation daily as I remember saying to the animation supervisor, you know what, you're not going to see any of this stuff at the start of the shot because of the water effects, but they basically said, no, 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 you got to do it anyway. Uh, so I had to do it all really, really carefully and it all had to be done really, really carefully. And he had to, he had to pick the dragon up and, and, or, and throw it up in the air and catch it and kind of shake it and then fling it at the rock. And of course, you cannot act this stuff out, right? You, and you're not going to get reference for this. So the, and, and I really struggled with this shot until, and I really wish I'd kept the thumbnails from this, until I planned it all out with thumbnail sketches. And that was the secret of success on this shot. 
was it was all in the planning because it was all about getting the 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 kind of wave action because the action was basically picking up the dragon throw it, catching it in there uh, and, that, and that kind of whip action of the sea serpent lifting up its body and doing a kind of whip motion like that and then a kind of shake and then a splat um, and, it, and it was only when I thumbnailed it and got the whip action right that it actually felt right and then after that it all it all um, it all worked well but it was very very hard shot to do and then this kind of slipping down on, on the rocks was very different difficult remember there are no dragons sometimes you just have to imagine it uh, and at that point thumbnail sketches are, are your best friend um, and in this case that's that's how it it it, um, it ended up working. But it was a very, very difficult shot. And there was an awful lot of secondary animation to animate here. All these kind of tentacles and spines and squiggly things. And uh, it was really very, very difficult. So I've got a question here um, from uh, Joseph. Hi, Joseph, uh, one of our um, escapees. Uh, how many animators per character on robots? Uh, okay, so that's a good question. Um, and um, in the old days, you would be on a character unit. So on the Lion, clip, Lion King clip that I showed you, there were, f I think, four animators working with Andreas Deja on the SCAR unit. So I was, and I was the most junior by, by some distance. Um, and uh, so there were five of us. But the key thing in the old days on the 2D animation was that you needed a consistency of drawing. So a shot would actually get split. So if, for example, I was animating a shot with, and actually, I, I probably should have said at the beginning, I didn't do the hyenas in any of those shots. I only did Scar. The hyenas, I think, in the first shot where Scar lands, those were animated by Greg Manwaring, and the hyenas in the shot where uh, Scar kind of kicks uh, the hyena out of the way. Um, uh, actually, I forget who that was done by, uh, but uh, it was done by a, a, a different um, animator, not by me. So uh, it was very much character dependent. Nowadays, it isn't done that way. And you, you will find yourself, if you're lucky, working on a sequence of shots on a film. So hopefully you would get uh, a chunk of the movie, you know, five or six shots strung together, uh, and then you, you'd get those to work on. But it doesn't always work that way and you shouldn't rely on it. And actually on, on robots, we would get, there were about 40 animators on that movie uh, and a sequence would get broken out of 3D layout, and there might be 40 shots in the sequence. And if you've got 40 shots in the sequence, and there's 40 animators on the movie, nobody has to be a genius in maths to figure out you're gonna get one shot. And you've gotta make sure that those hook up with the uh, work being done by the other animators. So the start, the, your, your pose at the beginning has gotta match up with the last pose from the previous animator, and your pose at the end has got to match up with the first pose of the next animator shot. So it's a lot of work to get that right uh, and can be quite uh, uh, difficult to do. Uh, now, uh, let's see, uh, Sagar Katara is asking how to find good references for creatures like dinosaurs and dragons. Um, yes, okay, so, so this is a really tricky one. And what I recommend actually is that you watch, there's a very, very good video uh, by the uh, lead animator Otto, sorry, Simon Otto, who was, who was the supervising animator on How to Train Your Dragon. And I, I worked with Simon many years ago at DreamWorks. There's a very good video put together by the Academy of Motion Picture, Picture Arts and Sciences, known as the Oscars, um, on how, how they approach that um, and, in, in, and how they did those, those fantasy creatures. It was quite complicated because the anatomy of those creatures is very much a hybrid. And again, um, uh, they had Stuart Sumida consult on that movie. Uh, and he essentially designed the anatomy for them so that it would be a mixture of a big, powerful bird like a condor or an, or a, uh, an eagle combined with a lizard. So trying to combine those two things anatomically uh, to make sure that you get, it, you, you get it right. And then you're watching a lot of reference of of birds in flight, big birds, um, eagles, uh, and, and also the way lizards move, that kind of snake action that lizards have in order, in order to make it feel, feel believable. Um, so a uh, question from Angelo Garazzone. Hey, how's it going? Uh, what makes a character believable? Can a good storytelling get rid of good animation or are the two things necessarily connected? 
well, ultimately, you want everything to work together, right? So if you're working on a film, you want the characters uh, and the story to work together. I, I think actually Chronicles of Narnia is a good example of uh, where we did some really, really, uh, you know, some really beautiful animation on this film, but maybe the story wasn't so good uh, and, and the film didn't work quite so well as a result. Um, and I don't think that's any fault of the filmmakers. I think that's actually just the source material wasn't as good. If you look at the Chronicles of Narnia, the, the first book, um, The Lion, Witch of the Wardrobe, is a, is a work of genius. I mean, it's a brilliant, brilliant book. But the others, I think, are, are less um, convincing. You can make a less convincing case for those. Uh, and so it was harder to bring those other, other stories to life. So you can, and I've worked on many films where we did really marvelous animation, but the storytelling wasn't as good. And, and ideally, you really want both of those working together, like, say, on Lion King, uh, or on Who Framed Roger Rabbit, or you know, if you're lucky enough to get on those films, or indeed the Harry Potter films, which have beautiful storytelling. So, um, Dubai and Daz and, uh, asks, um, which animation technique do you prefer while planning a shot? Pose to pose, straight ahead, or a combination of both? So that's a good question, pose to pose or straight ahead. And really, um, I don't work straight ahead at all. I'm just not good enough to work that way. I have to plan my stuff out. And that's why I think it's so important to, uh, to understand how to use thumbnail sketches and how to plan your work um, using thumbnails and, and, and planning things out carefully. Because I think if you, if you don't use thumbnails, it can be really, really very difficult to plan stuff out. So uh, all of these shots here, um, these are, this is essentially all pose to pose animation. You've got a pose for when I'm a bearskin rug, a pose for they can walk all over me, a pose for but until that happens, and then a pose for I ain't going out without a fight. And that's kind of a, uh, that's sort of an A, a B pose thing going on there. So really it's, it's all about the planning. The trouble with straight ahead animation is it's just too instinctive and intuitive. Of course they have to do it um, if, if you're a stop motion animator, you have to work straight ahead. But that's why stop motion animation tends to have that bumpy, slightly kind of um, uh, uh, almost mistakey feel to it because it, it does have uh, it does have mistakes in it. So let's see. So it's um, five two. So we've got about um, uh, five minutes left. So I'll just take a few more questions and then I think we'll have to wrap it up. Uh, now. Um, uh, drawing, let's see, so Shalini Chitani asks, drawing thumbnails or acting out the shot, which is better? I would say both. I always shoot live action reference and I haven't shown you any live action reference here that I've personally filmed, um, but I shoot live action reference all the time. Uh, unfortunately, I've, uh, don't, I didn't keep my live action reference for most of the films I've worked on. Uh, I should have done. Uh, and I, I regret not having kept more of it now because nowadays you can actually import that directly into Maya. Uh, and there's a, a technique um, that I can show you. If we go to the animation blog, so if we go to, if I just search for animation blog, there we go, Escape Studios animation blog, uh, which I uh, work on, uh, update regularly. So if I search for live action reference, there's a page here which explains how to use live action reference. There we go. How do animators use live action reference to create believable animation? And this is all about, it's, it's basically a step-by-step -step tutorial on how to do it. Um, and you can import an image plane into your work and then use live action reference. Um, and actually, uh, why, is, why is this not showing up? It should be, that's curious. Okay, some problem with Chrome there. Uh, that's annoying. But if you go to this page, you'll see, um, uh, you'll, you'll, you'll be able to find this blog post. And um, it basically explains to you how you can import an image plane in Maya and how you can get your reference right into Maya and then use that as the basis for, for your animation. Uh, there's all kinds of useful information at the Escape Studios blog. So I highly recommend coming into this regularly. You'll see what we're up to at Escape Studios and upcoming events and all kinds of things to do with, with animation. Um, a question from Agustin Raj, who says, um, uh, can I have your email ID or Skype ID for a Q&A? Absolutely. So my email address here is actually here at the blog, alex.williams1 at pearson.com. I'm always happy to answer questions, look at portfolios, 
uh, and help out. So do send me uh, material. Do send me anything you want to know about what we do here at Escape Studios. Uh, that at is actually should be an ampersand. That's just to defeat um, spam. But I'm very happy to uh, answer questions. Um, Pedro Antonio uh, Dondi Chudan asks. So you mean you discuss the character uh, of the character with the other animators first? Yes. So. It's very, very important to establish character in, in, in films. And actually, um, uh, if you look at a recent blog post, we had Royce Wesley come over from Pixar, an animator who worked on The Incredibles, and he talked about this very thing where the, he, he actually talked about, interestingly, about working with um, animation dailies. And he, he was talking about how the animation supervisors, and he said, ah, they're not there to tell us what to do. It's more about supporting the animators um, and also about how particular animators will help to develop certain characters like for example Carl from Up who was a very uh, even though the rig had tremendous flexibility Carl is an old man and he doesn't have a lot of flexibility so the the animation on that character had to be quite stiff and rigid but that was very much part of the of the character um, so yes you, you'll find on a movie uh, there's still lead animators who determine the, the, the character and personality of particular characters, but often it's just an animator who has, has found a particular way of animating a character, and they might just kind of naturally emerge as one of the lead animators on that character because they just have a, a particular feeling or affinity for that character. So often it's not really about rigid structures, it's just about who's figured out some stuff on, on, on that character. So it can be quite flexible, really. Um, here's a question from uh, uh, Joseph. How exactly did you animate the sea serpent with the dragon? Were there any plugins used? Um, and no, there were not. And I actually, I didn't even manage to parent the dragon to the sea serpent. I had to do it all manually. Uh, so it was very much a keyframe approach. But as I say, it was very, very heavily based on the thumbnails. And it was only once I'd figured out the whole motion in 2D that I was able to get it working in 3D because the rig was so complex and had so many controls. It was very, very difficult to pose it out. Um, so I had to basically do a, a, a kind of 2D animation approach, work out all of the animation in 2D before I committed to it using the 3D rig. Um, Altaf um, asks, normally during an animation, how many frames do you assign for each pose? Uh, that's a good question. I mean, that, of course, is a big question about timing, about how you time out animation. Um, and um, in essence, what you're doing when you're looking at these thumbnails is you're, you're kind of figuring that out in the planning. So here, if we go back to these sketches here, when I'm a bearskin rug, frame 123, they can walk all over me, 153. So I know that there's about 20 frames in between these two poses. And when you're animating dialogue, you know, you do kind of get this because the, the dialogue will give you to some degree the, the structural timing of the shot. Obviously the shot starts at frame 101. So there's a pose there. And then there's another pose here at 123. When I'm a Babeskin rug, they can walk all over me, pose at 153. But until that happens, pose at 189. So one, 189 minus 153. So again, that's about, um, uh, so I'm not very good at maths. So it's, a, it's about a second, a little more than a second. And then until that happens, I'm going out without a fight. And then a little bit more time there, about two seconds. Um, so in each of these ones, is approximately a second. But, but you're kind of matching the pose up to the dialogue on stepped curves in Maya uh, to block out your work. So timing animation is, that is a big thing and that is one of the that, that that is one of the main things obviously that we teach at escape studios is how do you time stuff out uh, but but there you know live action reference will help you enormously with that um and and you know uh something like the sea serpent you're not going to animate that on stepped curves you're going to do that on, on on spline or linear curves whereas something like this shot here booed from open season that's going to be a pose to pose shot where you are working on stepped curves planning it out in the kind of old school, traditional 2D manner. A question from Gautam Shanoi says, can the same be done in 3DS Max uh, live action reference video? I'm afraid I'm not really that familiar with 3DS Max. I haven't used it that much. Um, we tend not to use it here, not because it isn't great software, it's very good software, but uh, the industry is now so dominated by Maya 
that I do recommend learning Maya rather than Studio, 3D Studio Max, just because the um, studios do tend to hire um, artists with, um, with Maya experience. Uh, Shalene asks, or Shalini asks, is there any reference or any tips on animating a run cycle of a dragon? Because dragons have two legs. I want to do a run cycle on a dragon. Um, well, uh, most two-legged two -legged run cycles are basically going to be the same, whatever they are. So you can take any run cycle and you can fit that onto your dragon. If it's a two-legged dragon, it's going to be more or less the same as a human running. So you can take a human run cycle and just transpose that onto your dragon and that should work fine uh, because two legs really only works one way. So it's rather like, you know, quadruped locomotion is all the same. So two-legged locomotion is all the same as well. So even though it's a dragon, it's basically just a run cycle. Um, and Debayan Das asks, in pose-to-pose -pose animation, I follow a simple rule between two poses, which are pose, anticipation, breakdown, cushion, pose, and settle. Is this the right method? Yeah, that sounds about right. Um, yeah, pose, anticipation, breakdown, cushion, pose, and settle. That, that sounds like a great methodology. I mean, animation is all about anticipation, action, reaction. So if you're, if you're doing those things, you, you're probably on the right track. Uh, so we're almost out of time. I'm just going to uh, take one or two more here. Um, Jim asks, do you have any tips on where to put in realistic, somewhat jerky motion into animation curves rather than uh, looking too CG with smooth arches? Um, that's a quick chart. I'm not sure I'm fully understanding the question there. Uh, but I think, I think what you're getting at is making stuff more pose to pose. And that is one of the challenges with, with using live action references. If you follow live action reference too closely, everything ends up being too smooth and too spliny. So what you have to do when you're adapting live action reference is to make it more pose to pose. So you need to, you need to push the, um, the timing more towards the pose, uh, the key poses and have fewer in-betweens and make it less smooth more snappy, more pose to pose, uh, and less, um, less spliny. Um, uh, Agustin asks how to rig for multiple object creature character for animation. Well, luckily enough, <laughs> I can skip that one because I don't know very much about rigging. So um, actually we do have a webinar. If you go to our website and find, look for a webinar, there's a great webinar by one of our very talented uh, tutors, Mike Davis, who actually rigged Smaug on The Hobbit and also the Minions. Um, and he has a, a tutorial, uh, a, a webinar tutorial introduction to, um, to rigging, which is really, really great. Okay, I'm afraid the other questions I'm not going to be able to answer. If, if I haven't got to your question, I would strongly recommend that you send me an email and I will answer it in my own time. So do feel free to contact me, alex.williams1 at pearson.com, and I will do my best to answer your questions. I hope you've all enjoyed this webinar. It's been really fun doing it. Uh, I love doing web webinars here at Escape, and we always get great questions and really great interaction. Um, and I hope it's been a useful introduction to the challenge of animating uh, non-human characters. Do keep in touch. Send me an email. Make sure you keep an eye on the blog. If you click up at the blog here on tips and tricks you'll find all sorts of technical stuff here's some thing uh, some stuff on frame store animation workflow um, if you scroll down you'll find all kinds of other things um, uh, there's some great resources like a free ebook on on animators workflows uh, some stuff on on tv animation file referencing all kinds of really really useful resources for animators um, at the animation blog. So make sure you check in. So it's been a real pleasure hosting this. I hope you've got something useful out of it. And uh, come in and see us at Escape Studios. Send me an email, keep in touch. Uh, and uh, uh, hope you guys do some great animation.